Amen. All I can say is, wow, that was good. That was good. You know, uh, Brother Danny, I figured it up. From the time we left Romania to come back home, we traveled for 31 hours. And I came in this morning still dragging, but that just zapped me right back, ready to preach. So uh, thank you, uh, choir. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Well, this morning I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter... And we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 36. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. I had the uh, blessing of being able to, uh, to preach two different times in Romania. So just, you know, if I begin to, to speak Romanian, just kind of go along with me. Yeah. <laughs> I had some good interpreters, so I just hope that they said what I said, so we'll just trust the Lord with that. But it was, uh, it was good. It was a great trip, and certainly uh, look forward to sharing more about all that God did on our trip. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. The Bible says, But I say to you, you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you good do good. Do good to those who do good to you. What benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lead to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Well, let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for the time of worship that we've had. Lord, we thank you for the message that we just heard proclaimed through song. Lord, that is our statement of faith, that you are the only way, that Jesus Christ, you are our hope. And we thank you that we can sing that song with confidence today. We thank you that we have a song to sing in this world that is filled with so much wickedness and evil and sadness and turmoil, we know that we have a rock to cling to in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes and open our hearts to receive your word. May we leave here changed. May we leave here different. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I, I'm preaching a... A second part to a sermon that I that I preached a couple weeks ago, uh, and the title of that sermon was a shocking sermon. This sermon, as I had explained a couple weeks ago, is really the the sermon that is recorded in Matthew chapter five. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and certainly this would have been a shocking sermon for those who were there uh, that day. In this sermon, Jesus really gives a, a new ethic, a kingdom ethic, which was polar opposite of the thinking of the day and, and is, is the same today. The, the message of the Sermon on the Mount goes against the, the way that the natural man uh, thinks. And really what Jesus does in this sermon is he, he really defines for us, what it means to walk in the Christian life, what it means to be a believer, what should what should characterize the life of a believer. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is Christianity 101. And in today's text, he really gives us something that seems to contradict itself. Love your enemies. Certainly, that would have been shocking for the audience of that day. Uh, for as you know, many of the people, the Jewish people, were looking for a Savior. They were looking for one who would deliver them from the oppression of the Romans. 
the Romans were viewed upon as their enemies. And here comes Jesus teaching them that to be a follower of him, they must learn to love uh, their enemies. So he deals with this issue of love and, and, and mercy. Now we know from the Bible that God, he is love. First John 4, 8 tells us that. The Old Testament taught that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. In the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 19, 18. And then in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, Jesus said the whole law could be fulfilled in this, loving God with your entire being and then loving our neighbors as ourself. So the Bible teaches us the definition of what it means to be a true believer. If you want to know if you are saved today, so often what we do is um, we say, okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian because I remember that time that I said that prayer. I walked the aisle and I was baptized. And that's how I know that I'm saved. But how do we truly get assurance that we are believers? Well, we go to the Bible and we learn what God says a believer is. And there's several things in the Bible that he tells us are the marks of a believer. First, there is the issue of repentance and faith. A true believer in Jesus Christ will repent of their sins. They will turn from their sins and by faith accept the Savior. They will cling to the Savior. There is this mark of humility. You can't repent of your sins unless there is this, this mark of humility in your life. It takes humility to repent and acknowledge your sins. There is this concern for God's glory when you are saved. It's, it's this transformation that happens in your life and the focus of your life is no longer uh, about you. It's, it's about God's glory and His will being accomplished in your life. There is a, a hunger for God and His righteousness. If you're saved, you have this hunger. You have this gnawing, this desire in your heart to know God. And to worship Him and to, and to learn about Him. Uh, the, the Bible, in, in its definition of a true believer, speaks of this, this separation from the world. You, you think differently than the world thinks. You are motivated by things differently than the world. Obedience, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Fruit, uh, joy, peace, patience, self-control. But above all, a mark of a true believer is love. Love. It's a love for God and then a love for other believers and for unbelievers. First John 4, 8 says anyone who does not love does not know God. That's pretty clear, right? First John 4, 20. If anyone says they love God and hates his brother... They are a liar. So our text today speaks of love and how to handle our enemies. How are we to relate to our enemies? Well, we relate to them by loving them. And really, the bottom line is this. If as Christians we can't love one another, then how will we ever be able to love our enemies? So this is a this is a pretty simple message, but it's a difficult one to apply to life. It's a supernatural task. It's something that only God can do in us. We can't do this in our natural state. Now again, remember Jesus. If you recall, uh, when we were when we were here a couple weeks ago, Jesus talked about the blessed person, and, and he said, "Blessed are you." When people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and, and spurn your name as evil. And what Jesus was saying there is, is if you are committed to me, if you are committed to Jesus Christ, if you have decided that you are going to follow after Jesus, there will be people who will dislike you. And there will be those who will say mean things about you and they will lie about you and they will persecute you. That is a promise from our Savior. In fact, he said, if they persecuted me, why would you dare think that they would not persecute you as my followers? 
And so Jesus follows up with this lesson that those who hate you because of your faith for me, those who lie about you and say mean things about you and persecute you, how are you to relate to those individuals? Well, you relate to them in love. So let's look at this issue of love that Jesus speaks of here in this text. A couple of things I want to point out. First of all, in verses 27 through 31, we see this first truth. And that is this, the love Jesus commands is not natural. The love Jesus commands is not natural. The, the natural way of thinking for us as people is to hate your enemies, to get even with your enemies, because it's all about you. We are to guard our honor. And so we respond to those who hate us with hate. That's the natural, that's the natural man's way of thinking. But notice in verse 27, this expectation that Jesus says. He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. So the expectation that God has for us as his children is very simple. We're to love our enemies. We're to do the exact opposite of what the natural man says to do. His audience, he says, to you who hear. So this sermon was not just given to the multitudes in general. This was given specifically to his followers, to those of you who hear. Jesus, see, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. God's people recognize the voice of of God. And God's people, what Jesus is saying here, he is saying God's people live by a higher standard than the world's standard. And we don't do this to be saved. We don't say, okay, I'm going to I'm going to earn God's favor in my life and I'm 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 going to do everything I can to love those who hate me, and when I do that, then I will earn God's favor. No, Jesus said, you will do this if you truly hear me. In other words, if you truly belong to me, you will do this. Love your neighbors. This is not natural. Again, this is a supernatural love. In the Bible, there's several different Greek words for love. You, you have the, the Greek word storage. This is just kind of like a, a, a word for natural affection that you may have uh, for somebody. There is an eros love. This is like a romantic sort of love. This is the this is the love that we we think of uh, today when people say, "Oh, we're in love," or when somebody says, "Well, we 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 just you know we just grew apart and and we and we we fell out of love. We were no longer in love." That's a that's an eros love, a romantic love. And then there's a phileo love. That's a love of friendship love that you would have for your friends. And then there is this love that Jesus speaks of. This is an agape love. This is a, a love that genuinely seeks the welfare of others. It is a love of the will. It is a, it is a love that puts others first. It's, it's not about what is best for us, but it is, it is what is best for others. This love is not based on emotions. You don't fall into this kind of love. This is a love of the will. This is a love that you must choose to extend. And so Jesus expects more from us than just refraining from seeking vengeance or avoiding our enemies, but he expects us to go a step further and extend an agape love to those who mistreat us. So that's the expectation. And then he gives in verse 28 an explanation, an explanation of what he means by this. And really, he starts at the end of, of, of verse 27. He speaks of unnatural deeds. He says, do good to those who hate you. Do, unnatural, do what is unnatural towards those who do wrong to you. It's returning good for evil. That's what Jesus is saying. Remember the Old Testament with Joseph and Joseph's brothers? They sold him into slavery. 
And then in God's providence, his brothers come into the land of Egypt and Joseph recognizes who they are. And how does he react to them? Does he throw them into prison and get and get and get even with his brothers? No, but he returns love. That's what Jesus is saying. Unnatural deeds, unnatural words. Bless those who curse you. Return kind words for ugly words. I remember uh, when I was in seminary, I worked for, and I don't know if I've said this before, but I worked for a, a truck rental company, Penske Truck Leasing. And I remember one time this lady, she was a, she owned a company, and she just came right off the street. She didn't have a, a reservation. And she was in desperate need of a truck. And I had a truck sitting out there, but there was it was already reserved. And I kindly explained to her that uh, I didn't have any trucks, that I would try to to get one brought in, and I would call her as soon as I could. And in anger, she looked at me and she said, You need a lobotomy! I was like, A lobotomy? What's a lobotomy? Does anybody know what a lobotomy is? It's not good. (laughs) Now, everything in me wanted to react with ugly words. But by God's grace, I refrained. Until she left. (laughs) so it's unnatural deeds it's unnatural words then he says unnatural prayers pray for those who abuse you have you ever tried that praying for those who hate you who do wrong towards you who say bad things about you who lie about you it's hard to hate somebody While you're praying for them. Jesus says. Do unnatural deeds. Do unnatural words. Unnatural prayers towards your enemies. Then he moves along in verse 29 through 30. And he gives these these illustrations. These illustrations. And and, and conventional wisdom of the day. Basically said if you hurt me. I'm going to hurt you back. If you steal from me. I'm going to make you pay. So Jesus gives these illustrations, and there's, there's three of them. And he says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, well, you offer your other cheek. Now, what was Jesus teaching there? Now, he's not talking about, as believers, we have to be passive and defenseless. But his point is, is when you are wrong, your first inclination is to, to react so that you protect your honor, to reciprocate. But he says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek. In other words, don't reciprocate, don't retaliate in order to defend your honor. Instead, continue to love and minister to that person. And he says, if someone takes your cloak, we'll offer your inner cloak. In, in, in those days, you would have an outer cloak garment and then you'd have an inner cloak inner garment. He says if someone takes your outer garment, we'll offer your inner garment as well. He's not teaching that as believers you don't lock your doors at night and you put a sign on your door and say, hey, come on in and get whatever you want. It's not, he's not talking about that. But he's saying if someone is desperate enough to, to steal from you and they really need it, don't retaliate with hate, but continue to show love. He says if someone comes to you and, and they beg, they have a need, and, and, and they have a legitimate need, and, and, and you know good and well that they have a financial need, and they ask you if you can help them financially, and you know that they will never repay you, Jesus says, give to them. Give to them. Now, he's not saying that as believers we're expected to just be, uh, you know, undiscerning in our benevolence. Certainly, if, if somebody has... The reputation of just, you know, they're in the economic condition they're in because they're lazy or they're irresponsible with their money. We can do more harm to that individual by, by continuing to support their, their problem. But we must be willing to help those who have a legitimate need, even when we know that they will never repay us. So, we are to respond to wrongs with positive ministry. And then in verse 31, he gives the summation of it all. Notice what he says. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. This is like the golden 
rule. We are to put ourselves completely to the side, pride in everything, and we're to ask ourselves, how would this individual want to be treated? How would I want to be treated? This is what Jesus says. And you know, if somebody is your enemy, and you go to that individual and you, you, you return love to that individual, you are not responsible for their reaction. You are only responsible for your reaction towards them. So the love Jesus commands is not natural. Number two, second major division here is found in verses 32 through 34. The love Jesus commands is not normal. It's not normal. Again, normal practice is you love and do for others when there is something in it for you. When you know that, that somehow there's going to be a benefit towards you. What's in it for me? That was the mentality of Jesus' day, and that is the mentality of our day. What is ultimately, by me doing this for, the, for this individual, what am I going to gain from this? Jesus said, hey, uh, even sinners love those who love them. I mean, that's easy. You say, what is that? What does that benefit if you simply do good to those who do good to you? Or if you lend to those whom you expect to give you something in return? There's no benefit in that. Now, I was thinking about this. Um, you know, I, I've seen videos of people like Saddam Hussein loving on his family. Well, sinners can do that. But to do this kind of love that Jesus calls us to, this is, this, is, this is not normal. It's, again, truly seeking the highest good of others to the exclusion of self because we've been called to a different standard. And we are to do what is abnormal, not what is normal. Number three, verses 35 through 36. The third and final lesson we get from this is the love Jesus commands is noticed or will be noticed. It will be noticed. You can be in a huge crowd of people and notice when one person really stands out. You ever seen that when you know, you're in a crowd of people and there's just that one individual and they just really stand out because they are different. As believers... If we're going to be the followers of Christ that he has called us to be, we will stand out in a crowd. We will be different and we will be marked by our love. He says three things will happen. Three things will happen. First of all, you'll stand out. They will see that you are a child of God. So often we look at children and we'll say, that, that little boy, he favors his daddy. He looks just like his daddy by the things that he says and, and what he looks like. That should be true of us as, as, as Christians. We should favor our father. And the greatest way that we favor our father is by loving like God loves, an unconditional love. So when we love like this, the world is going to notice. They're going to see us. And he says, when you love like this, you will be rewarded. Now, what did Jesus mean by that reward? And, and, and on, on just a simple reading of this, you think, yeah, the reward is going to be we're going to receive heaven. But Jesus is talking about something different here. When he says that when you love like this, you will be rewarded. The reward is, is that the, the, the lost world around you will see the love of God in you and they will be drawn to him. And that will be your reward, seeing people transformed, seeing wicked people, your enemies who hate you, being softened because they see the love of God in your life. And that will be your blessing. That will be your reward. And then finally, he says, when you love like this, your faith will be affirmed. Your faith will be affirmed. He says, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Literally what He is saying is, you will show yourselves to be sons of the Most High God. 
So when you love like this and the world notices the love of God in you, you will be affirmed that you truly belong to Jesus. How do we know we're saved today? Because we said a simple prayer when we were eight years old and we got baptized and we've been a member of this church ever since. Is that how we know we're saved? No. We know we're saved by looking at our lives and saying, do I display this kind of love towards my enemies? So how do we apply this to our lives? I mean, how do we, how do we react when we go to the tag office? You ever been there? And you've been waiting in that line for hours and then you get to that lady or man or whoever it is on the other side of the desk and they're just really rude to you. How do we act, react, Brother Danny, when we've been traveling for many, many hours and we get to Munich, Germany and they just look at us and say, oh, your flight's been canceled. That happened, by the way. How do we react when you find out somebody is spreading lies about you? How are we going to react? Two, two words of application. Showing Christ's love is motivated by His love for us. How can we possibly love those who do not love us? How? By being motivated by His love that He has shown towards us. Just a few verses I want to share with you. Romans 5, 6. Some of these are familiar verses. But just let them soak in. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for good people. No, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 8. But God shows His love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Did you hear that? Before salvation, you weren't a friend of God, you were an enemy of God. But because of His great love towards you, you have been reconciled back to God. In John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Church, the only thing, the only thing any of us in this room this morning deserve is an eternity in hell. That is the only thing that we deserve. But because of God's great love for us, when we had no time for God, He loved us. And He called us to Himself. And He gave His Son who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven. So how are we going to love people who don't love us, who mistreat us? By thinking back on God's great love for us. And then finally, Showing Christ's love is powered by His life in us. Showing Christ's love is powered by His life in us. Romans 5.5 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The simple truth is you cannot, it is impossible to show this kind of love if you have never been born again. Because here's the reality. The only way you can love like this is if you have a strength that is outside of you. And that is the Holy Spirit. And then the only way that you can have the Holy Spirit is if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the moment you turn from your sins and by faith accept the Savior, in that moment you are born again and you are filled with the Spirit of God. And it is the Spirit of God that will empower you to love like this. And why is that? Because He wants the glory. He wants us to be able to say, I don't know how I was able to respond in love towards that one who, who mistreated me. It was not myself, 
but it was God in me, and he gets the glory. And so you have to be born again. And it's something that every single day as believers, because we battle against the flesh, we have to constantly go back to the cross and we have to say, dear Lord Jesus, help me with this individual. Help me with this situation. Because everything in me wants to do what is natural. I want to retaliate. I want to protect my honor. I cannot do it on my own. I need you. So Christianity is not just Christ in you, but it is Christ living his life through you. And so I just end with this. If this morning, if this morning right now under the sound of God's word, if there is somebody in your life that you hold hatred in your heart towards and you feel justified in your hatred towards them, if that is true, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Christ is not ruling in your life. It could be that you need to be saved. It could be an indicator that the love of, of God is not in you. The Spirit of God is not in you. And today your greatest need is not to come and be baptized. It's not to come and join this church and go out and try to make up for it by being a good person. It is by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and saying, Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you gave your life for me on the cross and I accept you as my Savior. Or it could be that you're saved. But you've taken your eyes off of Jesus. I dare not stand up here and preach this as if this is a simple thing. Because it's not. It's not. But as Paul said, through Christ, we can do all things. Well, let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this message. Lord, it's no wonder that we read in the Gospel of John after you had been preaching about what it means to be a follower of Christ, it said there were many who left to follow you no more. This is not an easy saying to receive. This is not something simple. This is something supernatural. This is something that only you can do in us and through us. Lord, I pray for anybody today who has hatred in their heart towards somebody. Lord, if the, char if, if, if the characterization of their life is hatred and not love, it very well could be that they have never truly come to know You as Lord and Savior. And I pray that today You would speak to their heart and that they would run to You for forgiveness. And for those of us, Lord, who we, we know we're saved, We've had that time of repentance. But we're struggling towards somebody in our life. Somebody who has genuinely wronged us. And everything in us wants to get even. We want to make them pay for what they've done. Lord, forgive us. Lord, when we think about how You loved us, when we were in our sin and you died for us. So, Lord Jesus, help us to be obedient to your word. I pray for those today, Lord, who they're struggling because they've genuinely been wronged. Maybe it was something that happened many, many years ago. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would comfort them as only you can. And I pray that you would love through them so that the world can see Christ in us. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said.